Good evening. Give yourselves an applause for joining us tonight. Oh, that doesn't sound enthusiastic. I, I'm wondering if you're worried about something here. It's good. It is a new year, and uh, new year is a natural inflection point that you must observe, unfortunately. And since you must, it is a new thing. You can start anew. So give yourselves an applause for coming out tonight. I am Reverend Dr. Dwayne Davis. I'm lead minister of Plymouth Congregational Church in Minneapolis. Uh, of late, I uh, served as co-chair of the mayor's working group on public safety. So I spent at least a couple of years uh, probably talking to many of you and engaging with you around these very topics. Tonight, we uh, join together because the city of Minneapolis and the Minnesota Department of Human Rights reached a court enforceable settlement agreement for police reform, which requires independent evaluation by a monitoring team that, uh, that is called an independent evaluator. As part of selecting the independent evaluator, the agreement prescribes the convening of two public meetings to solicit questions and feedback from the community that the city of Minneapolis and the Minnesota Department of Human Rights can use in their evaluation of potential candidates for the independent evaluator. The city of Minneapolis and the Minnesota Department of Human Rights invited three finalist independent evaluator candidates to give public presentations tonight as required by that agreement. I think it's important for me to point out and for you to understand that the independent evaluator is an essential third party, not one of the local state city uh, stakeholders, but a third party selected to oversee the transformational changes required by the court enforceable settlement agreement. The independent evaluator will play a range of roles, including developing measures and metrics to assess the city's progress, reporting on the city's compliance with the terms of the settlement agreement, engaging with the community to evaluate the effectiveness of the changes being made and providing technical assistance to the city and the Minnesota Police Department. Your voice in this process matters a great deal and your feedback on the candidates and the community sessions we're having is not just welcome, it's crucial. Um, you were invited to provide questions which the city and the Minnesota Department of Human Rights uh, looked at a series of questions that were sent from the community and selected some representative ones. And we are offering opportunity for you to pose some questions tonight. If you did not get an index card or a pen, you can do so now so that we can uh, curate some more questions that we might pose to the candidates. Over the next few days, you will have the opportunity to provide your thoughts on the candidates after uh, this session tonight. Uh, I think the city will provide an opportunity, uh, a feedback form for you to register your feedback on what you heard tonight from the candidates. After the presentations and after the feedback has been collected, the city and the Minnesota Department of Human Rights will make a selection uh, for the independent evaluator. And thank you for reminding me. Please silence your cell phones because it does take time out of when we're trying to uh, hear and people have to repeat themselves. The agenda for the evening uh, after I sit down, uh, the independent evaluator candidates will have an opportunity to make a presentation. They will have uh, 10 to 15 minutes to uh, make their presentation. You will hear presentations from effective law enforcement for all Jensen Hughes, and Relman Koufax in that order. Uh, at the end of those presentations, uh, there will be time for community questions and answers. We have gone through some questions that you have submitted, uh, and we will ask each of those, uh, each of the candidates to answer the questions. Each candidate team will have 90 seconds to respond to the question. Uh, I'm looking for a timer. Someone will be holding up. There she is. So that's your timer. 
Uh, we want to get as many questions in as possible, so uh, we'll pay attention to the person who's keeping time. And then we will wrap up, hopefully, at 8 p.m. on the dot. And I think I have gotten myself right in under that 10 minutes, and I'm proud of myself because I'm a preacher and we talk long. So now uh, we invite the candidates to begin their presentations, effective law enforcement for all. Thank you. Thank you all for giving us the opportunity to be with you here this evening. My name is David Douglas. I'm the president and co-founder of Effective Law Enforcement for All. And I would be serving as the role of the independent evaluator for our team. We appreciate this opportunity to share with you a little bit the journey that brought us all here together tonight. I want to introduce my team and I want to talk to you a little bit about how we intend to approach uh, our monitoring responsibilities, particularly focusing on the issue of community engagement. I have about 30 minutes worth of remarks, but I only have 15 minutes of time, but I'm from New York, so I don't think that'll be a problem. All right, so uh, if you've read the materials, uh, since 2013, I've served as the deputy monitor for the consent decree team in New Orleans. Um, but in the course of that work, I realized that consent decrees establish a common framework for policing practices that could be a vehicle to bring the public and the police together to achieve and implement a shared vision of policing that is safe and effective for the police and the communities they serve. And our tagline is pretty simple. Why? Because everyone wants to go home safely. We pick the name effective law enforcement for all because it's something that everyone agrees with. We may disagree about what it looks like or where you go or how you achieve it, but everyone agrees in that principle and that is our philosophy. We start from points of agreement and we build outward. A consent decree is an agreement. And at least starting there, the parties have said, this is what we agree to do. And our effort, our role as the monitor would be to hold them accountable for it and to help them achieve it, to start from the agreement and build out to narrow points of disagreement until we achieve full implementation. Our theory of change is pretty simple. People first have to be educated about safe and effective policing practices. That's what the agreement does for the departments that are subject to the consent decree. But it's important if the public wants to have account, wants to have the police, uh, wants to be uh, have oversight of the police, they also have to understand good policing practices. With that education, we empower the public to uh, provide that partnership and oversight, and then we work on engagement. Uh, the first icon there is our community guide to mental health. That's on our website. It's, we're building out information for the public generally. An example of empowerment is our work in Montgomery County, Maryland, where we did a collaborative reform project. And then in terms of engagement, uh, we sponsored this fall a collaborative reform conference in which we invited uh, uh, nonprofits, NGOs to come and speak about the issues of policing. Because we believe at the end of the day, police are accountable to the public, so the public should be in a position to hold the police accountable. Before I talk about our work, I do wanna introduce like our amazing team that uh, we've put together here. Their bios are in the material, so I'm not so much gonna focus on that, but I just wanna talk about each of them. So sitting at the far end of the table is Michael Harrison. Michael Harrison is the former superintendent of the New Orleans Police Department, and then the former superintendent of the Baltimore Police Department. Uh, Michael was my partner in effect, he represented the NOPD when we were the monitor, and we worked together to achieve compliance. Uh, I watched Michael ch uh, drive change in uh, New Orleans, and then again in Baltimore. He is a leader, he's a change agent, and he really has an ability to uh, uh, relate to all people. I watched him in the community. I hope you'll ask questions of him, and I hope we'll get to talk a little bit more about his work, but as we say in our flyer, what we've tried to do is form a team that understands this challenge from both sides, the challenge of driving and supervising change as monitors, but the challenge of driving institutional change uh, as institutional leaders to be a res uh, resource and support for the Minneapolis Police Department. Sitting here on the end in the row are uh, Marianne, okay. Marianne Viverette. 
Mary Ann served with me on the New Orleans uh, team and has also been instrumental in our building of a, uh, effective law enforcement for all. She led the effort in our Montgomery County project. Uh, Mary Ann has been the chief of the Gaithersburg, Maryland Police Department. She's the first woman to lead the International Association of Chiefs of Police. And she also served on the Commission for Accreditation of Law Enforcement Agencies. She is an expert in policing practices generally. We've walked the streets in New Orleans. We've worked together many years. So when I put together this team, I knew I wanted Mary Ann to be part of this effort. Next, I'm going to turn to Arlinda Westbrook. Arlinda Westbrook served as the first civilian head of uh, the Public Integrity Bureau in uh, the New Orleans Police Department. That's its internal affairs unit. But the reason I asked Arlinda to be part of this team is because from day one of the consent decree, she was instrumental in helping us build bridges with the department and building bridges with the community. She has an exceptional ability to listen to people and to translate back to others. And the number of times over the years that Arlinda has said to me, I don't think you're hearing what they're saying. This is what they're saying. This is what you're trying to say, but this is what they're hearing. And I have seen her bring us together on issues of policy changes, institutional reform, but also in terms of building ties and trust with the community. So and that's why I was so excited when she was able to join our team. Last but by no means least in the room is Barbara Harding. Barbara and I both served together as civil rights prosecutors in the Department of Justice where we prosecuted hate crimes and police brutality cases. Um, later when, uh, well, also Barbara then more recently, she represented the city council uh, for the city of Charlottesville, Virginia, when it decided to take down the Confederate statutes. She led the legal battle that allowed the council to successfully achieve that. But the reason I asked Barbara to be on this team is that when I was asked to review White House security after a plane crashed on the White House lawn, she served as my deputy. And Barbara has an amazing mind and infinite capacity to retain information and to organize complex, unprecedented projects, something that I thought would be very relevant to what we're hoping to undertake with all of you here in Minneapolis. Uh, Barbara is a partner with the firm Nelson Mullins, and she has pers persuaded her firm not to suggest it took any arm twisting because our partner's here, Barry Cooperman up in the corner, but they have agreed to provide pro bono legal support to our work. And I deeply appreciate that because in New Orleans, my firm provided hundreds of hours of pro bono support in addition to the work. So it's a tremendous leverage that will allow us to do much more in the course of our work at no expense to um, the city of Minneapolis. You see on the screen John Salomon. John Salomon is former lieutenant colonel with the Army in charge of logistics. What he does is he builds things. So in New Orleans, he created their Office of Secondary Employment from the ground up. He is a tremendous project manager, and that's what these efforts are. Implementation of a consent decree is fundamentally a project management challenge, and John is exceptionally talented at that. Racing through our team, Jerry Clayton is a use of force expert, currently a sher the sheriff of Washtenaw County in Michigan, 35 years experience there. He's a policing practices expert um, uh, for the DOJ consent decrees, ACLU, and others. He is our use of force team lead. Lisa Fink worked on policies for the Baltimore consent decree, and the New Orleans policies and the Baltimore policies really are setting the standard for policies for urban police departments today. So her, her expertise in knowing the evolution of those policies and her skill in drafting will prove exceptional. She has a career background in community-based work, um, and she is bilingual, bilingual. Bill Murphy. Bill Murphy is also part of our New Orleans monitoring team. Uh, he has extensive experience monitoring, but he was the former deputy chief of the Los Angeles Police Department in uh, in charge of training. He is an expert in training, and we watched him work closely with the NOPD to fundamentally change and develop its uh, academy program. Julie Solomon. Julie Solomon uh, is our mental health crisis support and officer wellness team lead. Uh, she's a social worker by training, but she has extensive experience in uh, mental health crisis support, and you'll see more information about her and our materials um, uh, but she'll she'll serve that role for us, and she's also worked with Alifa. She on our site, uh, we have a video talking about 
uh, safe and effective mental health crisis response for police departments, and she did that for us. Eric Melanson served as uh, Chief Harrison's Deputy Chief of Staff in New Orleans and in Baltimore. He is a strong manager, project manager experience, and data analysis. He oversaw the upgrade of the New Orleans data systems, Baltimore data systems, and he is also an expert in early intervention systems, uh, of which we are big fans. They save lives, they save careers. So enough about us, as they say, and now let's talk about uh, you all, the Minneapolis community. We were very impressed and inspired by the report that the Minnesota Department of Human Rights uh, developed and the feedback that led into this because it so nicely fits with exactly our mission. In fact, I would say we're not really here for a consent decree. We're here because our mission is to work with communities that are looking to partner with their police to achieve reform. In Minneapolis, the consent decree is the vehicle for that. But we see this as part of a broader mission, although the consent decree, I want to say, because the selection panel's here, we understand that that sets the boundaries of our work and we'll stick with it, we'll stay, we'll color within the lines. But what came out of that report is that the community wants to understand the systems of policing and how it works. They want the police department to better understand them, and they want to be able to oversee the police. And I love this quote that came out of the report, and someone said, but who is actually going to hold the police accountable? We are. Well, how are you going to do that, and how can we help you do that? One, our educational mission. And part of our work here will be to educate the communities that are interested um, concerning the elements of safe and effective policing and how they're articulated in the, in the consent decree. So this is not new to us. We'll be building on work that we have already done. You can go to our website and watch the clip of Julie. And uh, we also have one, I think, up on uh, use of force, uh, basics of use of force. We are used to working with communities. We work with the communities in New Orleans and Montgomery County. It wasn't a consent decree. It was a local initiative that was sponsored uh, by the county. They appointed a public task force. This clip here is the public task force. It happened at Zoom, but we take the community as it is given to us, and we work with them, and that's what we did there, and it's what we intend to do here, and let me talk about how we intend to do that. What you're looking at here is a relationship map. There's an application we can use to map out the organizations and their relationships in Minneapolis, and so we've started to populate it just based on the uh, MDHR report, this is just an illustration, but what you see in those circles, each identify an organization that has been identified in that report or in other sources as being involved in the policing and the police reform space. The outer circle you'll see differently colored, those tell things about the nature we would use those. This is just an illustration, the substance here is not right, we just did it to, for purposes of show. But those outer circles will tell us things like, what communities do you uh, seek to serve? What do you view as your primary mission? Is it primary police reform or is that just part of your interest? Um, and so we'll get a profile of all of the communities and the organizations in Minneapolis that, as the agreement says, are interested in the work under the consent decree. And the agreement says it is the role of the independent evaluator, us and me, to work with all these groups. So this map allows us to identify them and to know something about their work and their interests. To me, the really interesting part, though, is the lines. The lines show the connections between organizations. And so you'll see, because it was the Minnesota Justice Research Center that did the report, they have the most connections to the group. But as we develop it, we will know which other groups do you partner with? That'll be one colored line. What groups do you coordinate with? And the goal will be, in our first 90 days, to build out this map, but it will be a living document. So this map will help us to educate the Minneapolis, all of Minneapolis, about the work on the consent decree, but it will also help all of us lay the foundation for post-agreement compliance. Because if we all work together to do this, we will strengthen the connections between these organizations. Everyone will know more about policing um, at the end of our time than they uh, might now, and will be better positioned to carry on the work to ensure not only sustained compliance, um, but to address the issues that are going to come up that are not on anybody's radar screens right now. So to, in answer to the question, but who will hold the police accountable, we are, we see this as a tool 
um, that will help make that happen. And uh, we will own that. And we look forward to working with all of the groups uh, that are interested in this project. Measuring success. Transparency is important. I only have a minute, so I hope you'll ask questions. But in the top, that's the Excel spreadsheet we used in New Orleans. Here is a more sophisticated version that was used in Montgomery County. We take every paragraph of the consent decree. We break it down with the parties. We say, this is what we expect to see. Ultimately, they agree. And then this is project management. We work down the list. We meet regularly. We report. We update. Uh, a version of this will be available to the public so the public can see exactly what the status is and, and what the progress is, in addition to other reports that we will uh, um, uh, we will we will issue. And the final analysis, though, measuring success will be as much a matter will be not just a matter of what we've done, but will be a matter of what's not done. Success ultimately will be measured by uh, stories not told, complaints not made, litigation not filed, lives not lost, careers not ruined. If we do this right, we will have. Uh, less of the drama and controversy. We will have more public safety. We'll have more effective law enforcement. Uh, we are committed to and confident that we can help the city of Minneapolis achieve the goals set forth in the agreement. But beyond that, we actually uh, believe that Minneapolis can be a model for the rest of the country. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this time. I told you I'd race through it quickly. We look forward to uh, answering your questions, but we very much appreciate uh, the opportunity you have given us here. Thank you. I think you might have to come out of it. Having some technical issues here. Just trying to figure out how to advance this to our slide. Okay. There we go. All right, but let me, how do I advance this? Yeah, okay. there we go. Good evening, um, and thank you all for taking the time to be here with us this this evening and, and, and getting to know a little bit about our firm, uh, getting to know a little bit about our approach to uh, serving as the independent evaluator, should we have the honor uh, of being selected, um, and importantly, to hear about how we will engage this, this community. By way of background, um, my name is Sydney Roberts, and if selected as the independent evaluator, um, I will serve as the deputy evaluator. Um, I am a former law enforcement executive. I am a former leader of civilian oversight of law enforcement. I am an attorney. I'm an inspector, a former inspector general who spent time investigating abuse and neglect on pers of persons with developmental and mental disabilities. I'm also a former victim's advocate. I've dedicated my career to advocating on behalf of persons who have been harmed by the very institutions that were designed to, to protect them. And as I was leaving public service where I was serving as the chief administrator for Chicago Civilian Office of Police Accountability, an agency that had primary jurisdiction over the investigation of all officer-involved shootings, all complaints of excessive force, all sex-based complaints, violations of the Fourth Amendment, and all race-based complaints. As I was leading, leaving that agency, I wanted to find a place where I could continue to do the work that I have done in terms of ensuring that government institutions are meeting the needs of, their, of the people that they serve and that they are not perpetuating harm. And I wanted to continue that work because this work is, is, is personal to me. I'm a, I, I have a son. Um, I have a son who I worry about, who I continue 
to worry about should he encounter a member of law enforcement, a place where I spent a significant amount of my professional, professional career. And so as I looked, I went, I found Jensen Hughes. Jensen Hughes was a company that was asked to go to Ferguson after the death of Michael Brown, that was asked to go to Baltimore after the death of Freddie Gray, that was asked to go to Loveland, Colorado, after an elderly woman experiencing dementia it received excessive force from, from two officers. And I saw that they called the balls and strikes, that they showed no deference to law enforcement, that they reached out to the community and ensured that the community was a part of their, 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 their recommendations, that their voice was represented. And that's why I joined this, this firm. Now with me is my colleague, Rania, and Rania is gonna introduce herself. Thank you, Sydney. And um, hi, thank you so much for having us. My name is Rania Adwan. Um, I'm not a lawyer, nor did I come up in the criminal justice space. I actually started my career as a journalist. So similar to what you might have heard, I really am into storytelling and story seeking. Stories is how we communicate with each other. I then went into management consulting and I found my way into police reform. Um, after the murder of Mario Woods, I joined to support the San Francisco Police Commission and then went on to serve as chief of staff at the Oakland Police Commission. And now now I focus almost entirely across the country um, on ensuring that community does have a seat at the table and more importantly that they know how to use that seat. So not just to be able to weigh in sentiments and opinions, but actually really get stuck into some of the policy revisions of pro like shifting and changing um, protocols and practices of law enforcement so that they feel that they have, that they are heard and seen, and that also the police department that are serving them are actually serving them to their own expectations. I'm talking fast, I'm sorry, because yes, 15 minutes. Thank you, Rania. Um, we also are here with three other colleagues um, that represent a portion of our team. Uh, Ed Denmark, uh, Dr. Denmark, I, I, I should say, apologies, um, Regina Scott, and um, uh, Billy Green. They are also here with us. And in, in a few minutes, I'll introduce the rest of our rest of our team. Um, but I want to I, I want to open up. You know, we are not from Minneapolis. Um, we don't live here, um, but we do know this. We know a little bit about this community. After George Floyd was killed, our firm came in and was asked to do an assessment of the police department's response to those protests, how they engage the community, what level of transparency they afforded. And we talked to a, a host of, of law enforcement officers, but key to all the work that we do is our engagement with the community. And we reached out to the community and spoke with many, many members of this community. And we heard from you, you were candid with us and you shared with us your interactions with law enforcement. You shared with us how the murder of George Ford affected you, how it affected your family, and how it affected your community. And, 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 and we took that information, and that information guided our recommendations and it guided our findings. And we were also here just several months ago. And we, at that time, we come and we did an assessment of the Minneapolis Police Department's training capacity today to satisfy the requirements of the stipulated agreement. And again, we got an understanding of how the inner workings of this department works, but we also spoke with members of the community. And what is clear and what was patently clear is that there is a long history of negative encounters between this community in the Minneapolis Police Department that was underscored in the settlement agreement, which identified and concluded that this department engaged in a pattern and practice of violating the constitutional rights of this of these citizens. And, and, and so for us, we have an understanding of how the department operates and we have an understanding of your experiences. And we will bring that experience through our work as the independent evaluator. Now I mentioned some of the areas where, where our firm has been, but
but that is not that is not all. We we were in uh, Louisville after the death of Breonna Taylor, and there we were asked to do a top to bottom assessment. What we did was we looked at their use of force practices. We looked at their accountability system. We looked at their search and seizure practices. We looked at how they were training their officers. We looked at their engagements with the community. We looked at how they responded to persons with, with, with um, uh, experience in men, uh, 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 individuals in crisis. And we spoke to hundreds of members of the Louisville community. We conducted focus groups and we conducted a community survey. And it was that input from the community that drove our findings and our recommendations. In the city of Chicago, one of the things that we're doing right now is bringing the community and law enforcement together in partnership to identify alternative responses to a law enforcement response, alternatives to, to arrest. In the Virgin Islands, I serve as the federal monitor of the Virgin Island Police Department. And one of the things that we are focused on doing are ensuring the integrity, the thoroughness and object objectivity of the manner in which they conduct use of force investigations and citizen complaint investigations. Because we have learned in our experience that a, 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 a system where law enforcement has true and meaningful oversight and accountability is a way to build the, the, the community's trust and confidence in their law enforcement agency. Um, I'd like to, Rania mentioned that she's from California, so I'd like her to talk to you a little bit about our work in California. Born and raised, if you couldn't tell. Um, I that This is where I met Jansen Hughes. It was after, like I said, it was um, while I was there at the commission. And I won't belabor the point too much because we do have other things to kind of cover. But I think for me, the main takeaway is the snapshot of the places that Jansen Hughes gets into. And for me, it's the fact that we don't avoid terse conversations. We aren't we aren't really afraid of the difficult or the tricky situations, quite the, quite the opposite. We're ready, we're willing to facilitate, we're open to it, we've got the experience to do it. Um, and sometimes, you know, people don't like the results. So I think one of our recent reports was deemed scathing. Um, but we're here for it. We're here for the tough conversations and here for the remedies afterwards as well. So for me, that's the biggest takeaway. And thank you for letting me weigh in. Thank you, Rania. Um, as I've mentioned, we've done work um, in many, many different places. And I wanna make clear that we do not believe in a check the box compliance methodology. We know through our experience that a change in policy does not equate to a change in behavior. We know that an accountability system, while good and necessary, does not always lead to, behave to behavioral changes throughout the entire department. What we have found through our work is that transformational change occurs when there is a cultural change within the department. Their policing philosophy changes. And what that looks like is a policing agency that devalues violence, that does not believe that force is inherent in policing, an agency that values accountability, accountability for the officers and accountability for their fellow officers and a policing agency that solicits the input of their community and recognizes that it has value. And how do we go about doing that? We make sure that the community is at the table when they're talking about a policy, that the community is at the table when they're talking about revising a policy, that the community is at the table when they're talking about how an officer is going to be trained um, to, to, to comply with the, the federal laws and the state laws and department policy around use of force. And if they're gonna add policy, they're gonna add training, that the community is there to identify that training that is needed and to ensure that the community has an opportunity to weigh in in policing strategies. The one thing that we have found is that often a law enforcement agency says, yeah, I'm willing to change, but they don't know how. That is where the community comes in because you know how policing can be carried out. And between the two of you working together and in partnership, there can be a policing strategy that is trusted and that is, that is credible. And we have seen some success around this process. Our work in San Francisco, we put the community together with the police department and they co-developed a use of force policy that is getting national recognition as a model use of force policy. Five years down the road, in San Francisco, 
There is a reduction in use of force incidents. There is a community that trusts the law, uh, uh, that trusts and has confidence in the policy that is guiding that law enforcement agency. And so our approach is to facilitate a cultural change. And we believe we've seen it happen and we believe that it can happen here in Minneapolis. Now I mentioned that we've got three people uh, or the five of us from our team here, but our team is much bigger than this. And our team is, it's diverse. It's diverse in age, it's diverse in race, it's diverse in religion, it's diverse in ethnicity. We have members of the LGB, LGBTQ plus community and we have members of non-native uh, non speaking um, on our team. Our team is a collection of lawyers, law enforcement officers, data and research analysts. And I'm going to move because we have two minutes. Oh, my goodness. All right. So if, Hit I, it. I, if I talk really fast, just ask me in the questions. I'm going to go really quick. Press <laughs> subtitles. Um, I, I won't. Again, the biggest point to take away is that at the core of our philosophy and all the work that we do is, again, this community component. You've heard um, Sydney talk about San Francisco. It's not just about being at the table. It's knowing what to do when you're at the table. And I don't mean that in a condescending manner. Policy isn't easy to understand. And so how do I make it? How do I bring it down into normal language so that anyone on the street can offer their opinion and offer their sentiment and offer their ideas and then actually take it back, turn it into legalese and put it into, into policy? Not an exhaustive list, but really just modalities that we've used in the past, depending on the moment that's needed. And I think that's another thing that is really important to impart. You guys are so well adept at weighing in, so I'm not too worried about it, but I really, I'd want to hear from you as to what you need in that moment. A quick example. In San Francisco, the community was really skeptical and suspicious of their police department. What did we recommend? Within the first 24 hours of every officer involved shooting, SFPD must hold a town hall to share information with that community because they deserve it. In Bakersfield, we have a community advisory panel. That's the group that weighs in on policy. Um, I'm gonna turn it over because I think it's important that we close I am excited for your questions. Thank you, Rania. And, and, and I guess I want to close with this. Our time in Minneapolis after the murder of George Floyd, our time in Minneapolis assessing the training capacity of the police department has given us an understanding of the inner workings of this police department. And we, hold, we heard from a host of law enforcement officers. We also heard from you. You were very candid with us. We are ready to get started the day that we are selected, and we assure you that you will be included and will weigh in on every part of the way. And we'll answer that. We'll get to the rest of it through questions. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Reed Colfax, and I'm from the law firm Relman Colfax. We're a civil rights law firm out of Washington, D.C., where we primarily represent victims of discrimination uh, throughout the country. We've uh, monitored settled in, in agreements, and uh, we've con conducted civil rights audits. First, I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. You're investment in this process, your participation in the choosing of the independent evaluator is critical. And it's particularly important to how we are uh, approaching this application and um, our desire to become the independent monitor here, because central to our proposal and our belief is community participation. That is why this team came together, and that is why we submitted an application. Because we have seen in past monitorships uh, around the country that there hasn't been the community participation that is necessary to have a successful monitor or evaluation process. We believe that having the community participate early throughout and even after the monitorship process 
is the way to have a successful collaboration between the community and the police department and have long-term and sustainable change toward more fair and equitable policing. In collaboration with the community, our hope is to usher in, to measure, and to report on changes that are mandated by the settlement agreement in terms of what the police department has to do in relationship to their policies, their training, the supervision, and the conduct, and end up with a cultural change in the department to help facilitate uh, that cultural change where it is moving toward more effective, efficient, fair, and equitable policing. Secondly, we want to help bring in systems of accountability um, that would lead to a growing and earn trust from uh, the community toward the police department. And then finally, we want to build in capacity, a capacity for the community and frankly, a capacity within the police department to be able to maintain and sustain any changes that come about through the process of this um, settlement agreement and likely a consent decree coming from the Department of Justice. The ingredients for success are present in Minneapolis and perhaps present in a way that we have not seen in other jurisdictions. And our approach, if we're chosen as an independent evaluator, will not be an off the sh shelf approach. We recognize that Minneapolis is unique, just as Baltimore is unique and New Orleans is unique and Louisville is unique. Minneapolis needs an approach for Minneapolis. And the creation of that process has to include the community, the people who live and experience and feel policing have to be in part of that process to create the approach to how the successful monarchship should uh, proceed. Uh, so we truly uh, want to create a unique approach here in Minneapolis. And we as a team have learned from the lessons of the past, right? from the monitorships that have happened elsewhere. We have learned from those experiences and we wanna take the lessons to the next step rather than repeating uh, what has happened in the past to learn from it and uh, bring a more successful um, and in a sense educated approach. We come to you as a team with a great deal of experience. We have uh, community advocates and community members on our team. And um, hopefully during the process of answering the questions, you'll hear directly from all the members of our team. Uh, I just want to uh, briefly mention them. Dr. Raj, who I anticipate many of you know who is, <laughs> Uh, is an advocate um, in the Minneapolis community who has been doing this work uh, tirelessly for decades. Iris Rowley, who was a community member, is a community member in Cincinnati, sat where you are sitting now, and then has become a central part of the process for the collaborative agreement they have in that city and leading um, that police department to uh, substantial improvements. We have the Center for Innovative Innovations in Community Safety, uh, represented by Tahir Duck Duckett, who um, has been working with uh, communities and police departments throughout the country um, in creating new and innovative uh, approaches to policing. Then we have, as I mentioned, experts in civil rights. Okay? That's what I have done since the day I graduated law school of uh, representing communities, representing individuals who have been victims of discrimination, whether that be in the Flint water crisis or the black farmers litigation where I was an attorney, 
or leading um, the challenge to the discrimination against the uh, community outside of Zanesville, Ohio, that was denied water for five decades, or leading um, the fight to preserve the rights of the Gullah Geechee people on Sapelo Island, who have been denied uh, municipal services for decades and yet are paying you know, three, four times the, the taxes of the people who are receiving services. Uh, so a, a substantial and in, in, in addition to those, um, those experiences also challenging um, where appropriate, where law enforcement itself has uh, discriminated in leading some of that litigation. In addition, we have a uh, police and police monitorship experience. Um, Chief Mike Davis, who you, who's going to get up and speak as well, um, and Chief Thompson, who is not here tonight, but um, also has substantial experience in changing police cultures um, from within uh, police departments. Angie Davis, who uh, is a... Um, Angie Wolf. I don't know why I wrote down Davis. <laughs> yeah. And Angie Wolf, who um, is, has served as a monitor out in California, has expertise in, um, in, in, in data and how uh, important data is to share with the community, to arm the community with the knowledge and the skills to be able to use that data to be able to hold uh, law enforcement departments accountable. And then uh, finally, Christy Lopez. Christy Lopez, who may know more about consent decrees uh, in this country um, than, than anyone else, who has written the book, has written the playbook that a lot of folks have, are playing with in, in the consent decree, uh, decree context, but has also learned. And circling back to where I started, that um, Professor Lopez has seen what has worked what has not, and continues to want to push this process forward to being a way to uh, create successful, sustainable, long-term positive change within police departments. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Raj, who is going to spend a uh, few minutes uh, addressing you all. Again, thank you all for coming out. Dr. Raj. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Appreciate you all being here. Please give it up for yourself for being here. Right, this is what's going to make a big difference. So I, I'm, so as as was as was introduced, I, I'm from here. I've worked in this community. So I want to take the a quick moment for us to all recognize that we are all standing. Most of us, if not all of us, are standing on stolen grounds. When I honor the Dakota people and the Anishinaabe communities for their right resilience and their contributions to advancing justice work. I want to also take this time to honor the stolen bodies from the continent of Africa who continue to suffer, right, all forms of discrimination, racism, and trauma, and yet standing tall and pushing for change and fighting for justice and fighting for a better community. So I want to take this moment to recognize the original stewards of this land and the original stewards of the stolen bodies and the many generations of Black and Indigenous communities who are here with us. With that, I want to say that we are not here because of what happened right on May 25th, 2020. We are here because there's a long standing of harm as a tradition of law enforcement or enforcement and compliance that has disproportionately harmed our black and brown communities and our trans communities, right? And we hope that you will continue to stay in this journey of change, right? We can talk about transformation, right? Transformation and liberation looks like there is no police department needed. Right, But we're talking about change because with this consent decree, we have an opportunity to, as a community, to come in and participate fully in that change process. And without your energy, without your presence, without your footsteps on the ground, boots on the ground, we cannot do this, right? So I wanna appreciate all of the things that we have done, 
right? Whether it's Philando Castile, uh, Twin Cities for Jamal Clark has been pushing for change, right? Communities United Against Police Brutality has been on the ground, have been pushing for change, and we will continue this process of change. And with that, I want to appreciate DOJ, right? Y'all give it up for Department of Justice and MDHR for their presence here and coming right upon what had happened here, the lynching that happened right in 2020, May 25th, to do a study about what kind of harm our communities continue to experience, right? And without, with that report, we have an opportunity without your presence, so that opportunity will continue to disappear, dissipate, right? So please, please commit yourself to being present. I want to honor a, a very progressive city council that has continuously pushed for changes. So give us, give it up for our city council members who are here, right? Appreciate their presence and the many activists and community members who are here. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Uh, good evening. And, and one of the things that uh, is truly exciting about this particular team uh, is not only our commitment to community and a process of administering this agreement as an independent evaluator, the prospect thereof, but it's a deep wealth of understanding about how that process actually is actualized in terms of outcomes. When people talk about police reform, they actually want outcomes to be distinctly different than the ones that are occurring at the time. So we can talk about process, we can talk about, you know, you know, meeting and discussing and whatnot. But at the end of the day, what this report is looking to do is engineer distinct different outcomes. And what's important to understand about this, and the reason that our technical expertise is so mission critical here, is that you got members of this team that's actually done it, reconstituted police departments, uh, work with the community in a way that um, that community hasn't seen before in a way that actually uses the assets of the community in a way that reduces crime in a way that is sustainable, that you can engender more thereof, and also done it in a way that engenders a sense of, of true satisfaction and, and, and really uh, a true sense of value for the service that the police are delivering. What's important to note here is that policing is a complex adaptive system right? It's not something where you have different trunks, right, of individual pieces. Everything's connected. And the job of the evaluator here is to recognize those connections, uh, lend expertise where expertise is needed, but also, right, determine, right, with the community to what standard are we looking to perform to? That's the real effort of the work here, right? And this agreement gives us the beginnings of that, right? But what our team also represents is what it means beyond the agreement. So when we talk about building capacity, um, it's not just about building capacity during the process of administering the agreement. It really is about building capacity for this generation and the next. True substantive change, permanent change. So the reason we're involved in this is not simply to check the box, create another overlay, say this is like another city, because it's not. It's a very distinct area of the country. The history here matters. The words on within the agreement matter a great deal, and they're distinctly different than words in other agreements. And so the idea is, how is that best animated? How is that best come to life? And it's through the lens of community. And it's not just community in the sake of saying community, but it's them creating the standard by which everything within here is judged. If it doesn't impact the true sense of the experiences created by the police, then it's not effectual. And so our work is to leverage our experience as a collective to make that happen. Thank you all for those presentations. We are now going to go into the question uh, portion of this. Um, and I just want to point out, and, and you've probably seen, we have these index cards. If you have a question, uh, please get that index card and we'll try to get to as many as we possibly can. And we will try to consolidate. We, we're looking at some and we're trying to make sure that uh, we consolidate some of those questions to 
make sure that we get at least some uh, or as many of your questions uh, addressed as possible. Uh, I want to start with the first question, uh, and I want uh, it to, we'll start with Robin Koufax and, and then Jensen and then effective law enforcement for all. Uh, and again, these are community questions. This, these are not questions from uh, uh, the city of Minneapolis or the Minnesota Department of Human Rights. These are the questions that we've received. And so we want to make that clear that you, some of the community people, you may have a similar question that you have, and we're trying to make sure we have a representative number of those. The first... Yeah. I, I understand, but the reason, it, if we do that, a bunch of people will want to get up and then we, we'll, we'll miss all the, so please give me that card and I will ask your questions. Okay. They'll give you one. Okay. It's got uh, some set up. We, African Americans. Hey, man, hold on. We, oh, sir. African sir. Here, said nothing about African Americans and natives didn't in the city. That's what the complaint, that's what they filed and said about. But nobody can talk about us. They, nobody can talk about us. So I'm, I'm trying to say to y'all, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, Dr. Raj, I talked to Dr. Raj. He said, you already, we should be meeting, the community should be meeting with you. It's two uh, people, a community uh, a police, uh, a Michelle Gross group and the mediation team have been working with police this whole time. Talking about Dr. Rod's been here decades working in Minneapolis. I live here, I've been living here all my life. Okay. I, but, uh, uh, when I moved from Chicago, no, but they got to answer these questions, right? Because we don't get stuck with it when y'all get through playing this game right here. So no. I, I just. <laughs> We, we'll just we'll ask the question. Yeah, no, but I, I want y'all to uh, realize, no, with something that's going on here that I don't like as a community leader, that I, I don't like what's happening here, and I think oh, yeah. you're, trying to, you're trying to rub it over us one more time, that's right. and I can't afford it. I, I can't afford for y'all to play a game. Like you you up here now, Pastor, you was on the uh, team uh, uh, with... Uh, yes, uh, indeed. With, I know it. it uh, Dr. Rod, how, how did he get to meet with them before we get to see him when we've been working on this stuff for over 20 years. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what Dr. Raj is doing. We don't want to play that this time. We want a real fair evaluator. We don't want, we don't want nobody to come in here. I know Mike Davis. Mike know we've been fighting for this a long time. So I can't afford to let my community suffer one more time with a uh, dog and pony set. He should have met him. No, he should have let us meet with him, Rebecca. You let Dr. Rod do it. You went up it. So you should have let us in there. But uh, go ahead. Okay. But hear what I'm saying. We want to meet with y'all. Okay. We, our community want to meet with y'all. We want to meet with you. Okay. And this was say African American and native. Because that's who they beat. They beat me five times. And I'm still fighting to, to say we need the police. I'm still fighting for it. But you ain't gonna set me down when I, I'm taking up. I'm talking about my community. Yes. Don't just say George Floyd. You've been suffering. Yeah, no, I ain't gonna play this game though. We can do this today. I'll be there tomorrow too. Yes. I'll be there tomorrow too. No, but you should have had. You've been we meeting with us the whole time. You should have had it. Where Dr. Rod come from? Yeah. Come on now. I don't care. That's my that's my friend. You shouldn't have did this. You shouldn't have yeah. Yeah, he said, how you get to that team? How you get there? Yeah, I know what's going on here. And they yeah. plan. You ain't gonna play our community one more time. That's one of the question. One of the question. One of the questions is one of the questions that we have here is to ask them how did who are they who are they working with and how did they do it? So we'll get to it. Yes. Yeah, come on. Okay. I ain't gonna let you go down. Y'all ain't gonna do this stuff. Y'all ain't gonna do this stuff. Uh, this stuff. Uh, we wanna, we wanna meet with y'all. This thing's gonna get y'all. It's against the human rights department and the one that's setting this up. Okay. And make it fair. If they gonna, if they gonna have y'all come here, make it fair. They got something going on. And I'm, 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 I'm complaining right now. I'm complaining right now. And fuck to y'all. And I'll be there tomorrow. Y'all keep going. Okay. The department said you all said that you consulted with, I think it was Ferguson. Did you say Ferguson or Baltimore? I know Baltimore. With the, I, my thing is, it's a high percentage of black police officers, and I believe it's the department that you said one of the ones that you all said to work with. High percentage of black police officers, but
by black police officers. So how would you all be trying to work through that internalized racism that black police officers have against black people? So that's that's what we need. We need that. Uh, you said you worked with COPA. I used to Chicago back in the day, but there was some issues with COPA. But I got research. You all, Baltimore, I did the research on you all. You all still have high percentage. The police department that you said you consulted with have high percentages still of lawsuits, disparities in the past, okay. killing, misconduct, everything. So I don't even know why they on this panel because we should have been talking to everybody that sent an RFP. Okay. So how did okay. you get that I don't know, Al, I'm with you, but all I'm saying is, in my opinion, ain't none of them qualified. Okay. We're going to add both of those questions, those make remarks. We have a question that addresses that, and we're going to ask them to respond to the question. So even to your question, one of the questions here is what, for each of these teams, uh, what relationships and roles have you played here in Minneapolis? Who are those organizations and people? And how can Minneapolis be assured that we will receive the time and priority and attention needed, not based upon your prior relationships or prior organizations, but given, some of you said you don't want off the shelf. How do you address directly what is going on in the unique relationships and people here in this city? So again, the question was, what team members are you currently, are you, who are currently involved with people in this city or organizations, and how can we how can Minneapolis be assured that we will receive the time, intention, and priority needed for our situation right now? Go ahead. That was his question. He wanted to know relationships. You can sit there. Done. Go ahead. Uh, that's a question that's coming up later. There's a question that's come about what their work, that question is coming later. We want to ask his question about relationships with people now. You can, you can, from your seat, I think. You can. Oh, okay. So, L, thank you. Appreciate you. Appreciate you, Angel. Uh, um, I I am here primarily because I work in the streets, I teach, and I do not have an all-encompassing understanding of the 13 wards and 83 neighborhoods that compose Minneapolis. But I do know that I've been in the streets working with folks who have been harmed, who have been hurt, disproportionately of Black and indigenous communities and our trans communities. If I don't underscore that, let me underscore that again, right? Our black, indigenous, and trans communities have been disproportionately hurt, harmed by the so-called policing here. So our, my hope of being involved in this, because from, from knowing L, knowing NAACP, from, from uh, family supporting families, and many other such organizations, right? Alongside, right? Knowing many of the police officers, they were my students, right? They were my students. So I'm, I'm passionately involved in this process and I'm not here for positions, for recognitions, right? This is not about me, this is about us, right? This is about us and I need you all to be a part of this change process, right? Don't make a, this about me. If I have to leave this committee, I will. I'll resign, right? This is not about me, y'all, right? This is about us. Let us walk this journey together. And I know many of you here, right? If I would I just ask how many of you know me or I know you, right? That's not the issue though. The issue is that how have we built this relationship? We built this relationship not because I came to say hi to you. I came to work with you, I came to walk with you, and I came to lead with you, right? I am always willing and wanting to listen, learn before leading. So I appreciate and love you. And you know, I'm here because I feel this in my body. Love you. Thank you.
again, current relationships with people, organizations, and. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Denmark. No, you need it. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, sir, I appreciate it. I can hear the frustration. I can hear the anger. And and ma'am, same, same for you. I can appreciate that. And having people come in from out of town telling you that they're going to do things and promising things to you without you without you knowing us. I'm not naive. That's not a, that's not something that's that's easily done. I get that. So I, I can I can appreciate I feel your frustration. And I can assure you for, on a personal level. My experience here in Minneapolis has been I've worked I've worked here. I understand that, sir. Thank you. Please the community relations council. We've been at the table for decades, focused down. This is not frustration. This is to make sure that unlike any city in America and globally, that we get this done right, it's not political. It is done right with the right selection of individuals who are going to be here. So Davis too, you do why we work. The frustration we had when we first did it when the police department was on one side of the table. Community on the other side of the table. These past three years, the police department and the community have been working together to develop even another memorandum of understanding. This is not frustration. These are individuals who are speaking on behalf of citizens who cannot come here because this ain't in our community who can't pay the cost to come here. This should have been in our community. Where is our negative friend? Who is that? They can't come here. So my, my friend and all of you, excuse me. Yes, and I know I'm a pastor. I may be out of order, but I'm not an order for the community. I'm here to represent those who cannot be here. This is not frustration. This is for us to come together and get this right for Minneapolis and the whole globe who look at it on us. We have to take it. Fact, we don't even need none of y'all here to come here. We're going to do this ourselves because we are very well on the road doing it ourselves, even with Michelle and Edna, all of us can come together and get this done and get it done right. So please, we don't mind if you come out of town and, and cash it. It's the same thing with you. We're going to your church tomorrow. <laughs> okay, members of your church said, why are you coming to your church? <laughs> it should have been in Sebastian or it should have been in the native community. So this is not frustration, y'all. This is people who've been working every week and every day with the Minneapolis Police Department and the leadership. Mayors come and go, chiefs came and gone, but we're still here. We're not frustrated. We want this to work. And we're not going to go anywhere until we get this done. I appreciate that, sir. Thank you. And I can, and I can tell you this. The reason I'm here is because I want the same thing you want, right? And I don't want I don't want to see the good work that's been done go by the wayside. I don't want to see the cooperation that's been built go by the wayside. What we would like to do and facilitate is operationalizing the good ideas of the good work that's been put forth. So again, I can speak to, to answer the question directly. Yes, um, I worked. I was here as part of the team that that worked on the after action report um, on the um, police response to the civil unrest. Outside agitators, is that the report you're talking about? I, you refer to the violence protesters? Okay. Okay. I, I, again, I, don't, I don't know specifically what you're referring to, but I would gladly, gladly handle that question offline if you can point specifically to what we said. But I will say this. Yeah, yes. Yes. San Francisco Police Department has 4,000 police misconduct complaints. 4,000. About the only 7% of that was seven. Bakersfield Police Department has 94% racial disparities in drug arrests. 39 killings by police. Ferguson Police Department. Police violence is up 40%. Excuse me. Yes, else is in, Can we... we go, I'm going to say this. This is our last one. Okay, New Orleans Police Department, 73% misconduct settlement, 
99%, I mean, 80% deadly force, 86% police violence, 83% killed were black, Orlando Police Department, 63% misconduct settlements, 58% racial disparity, 48% killed. Black people killed by police. So here we're gonna. We're That's gonna, all I'm saying. We we want to ask. That they say they right, say. and we have a question that we want them to answer about the the work that they have done and the results that they have. So we'll get to that. But I want to I want to address the gentleman's question about the current relationships that mm -hmm. each of these candidates has in Minneapolis, who they're working with, who they know, what they've done. And how is that going to impact what they are going to do? So I want to hear, I want you to hear the relationships and their presence here in the past. Continue. Okay, thank you, sir. So as I said, we worked on that report and I can't speak to specifically who we spoke to because we do offer, we did offer confidentiality um, on that project of who we spoke to. But I can tell you, we spoke with, uh, we had uh, community listening sessions, we had focus groups, and our aim coming into this process now would be to capitalize on the work that's been done and to outreach those communities that either A, in the past, didn't meet with us, and B, reconnect with those ones that we did meet with to begin to, to continue to have these discussions and, and facilitate this, tra this transfer transformative change. The difference is, again, and, and I all due respect to all the work you've done, the challenge comes from when you try to do work sometimes and we're too close to the work. Our team offers that objectivity to say, listen, we hear you, we feel you, but we want you to look at perspectives from all sides and solving problems. And we can't simply sometimes let our own biases take over on what it is that we're trying to achieve. So our team offers that level of objectivity. It offers a level of professionalism and it offers experience from working both inside the police department and with community organizations in our last two experiences here. Thank you. Effective when so, so so the simple answer is we don't have relationships here. When we looked at the agreement and the proposal and the uh, Minnesota Department of Human Rights report, uh, two things jumped out at us. The first was the extent of community involvement here, and I've never seen anything like it. And we've had fortunately we're invited to a meeting with Communities United Against uh, Police Brutality. Uh, we received a letter from the Unity Community Mediation Team, which we responded to and we want to meet with them, but that's why we put up the map. We, we, we don't know the lived experience of this community and I'm not trying to replicate it. We want to build on the work that was done here. And the second feature about the agreement is the 90 day assessment period. So we're clear, our approach was not to try and come to come here with a community and get to it. We are going to use that 90 days to make the assessment, to talk to the groups and build on what has happened because this is, is a process that started before us. And if we do it right, it will last beyond us. So we don't know this community. We offer expertise. We offer commitment. We have a mission. But... This the communities here, the role they play is to partner with us to help us make it work better. And that's the way we propose to do it um, by studying in the first 90 days and then developing a structure that makes sense for these communities. And I can tell if we don't do it well, I know I'll hear about it. So you all will hold us accountable <laughs> yes, for that. Know. Yeah. Uh, the next question, and it's it's related to and and the gentlewoman gave us a lot of examples uh, that the, the, what's that? We did Dr. Rod. Yes. Um, this goes to and and she provided ample examples of the outcomes, you know, that don't seem to suggest the success, even though you might have listed it in your presentation. So the question basically is that uh, consent decrees have they drag on. They have a history of costing millions of dollars and delivering little. And as I said, the general woman provided some examples of some of the cities that you said you represented some of their outcomes. And the question is, um, do you consider those failure? Were, the, were those were those failed processes? If they were not, 
uh, why, wh how do you evaluate what happened? Uh, and then the question then becomes, how do you ensure that we have different outcomes or better outcomes than, again, what the gentlewoman laid out for the cities that you worked with? Uh, and we'll start with effective. First of all, thank you for that. And thank you. And thank you. Not only do we do we hear you, we see you and we feel you. We have been on both sides. I've had the responsibility of leading two departments that were in federally mandated consent decrees in New Orleans. But I took over in New Orleans in the second year of the consent decree where my predecessor saw to push back against it. And I came in in the second year when the mayor appointed me as the chief. And I acknowledge what the DOJ said about our department, because in the findings, they called New Orleans the most troubled department in America. And we were. And so I took over that department and we began to make strides. Now, four and a half years later, we weren't perfect. But in 2019, when I left to go to Baltimore, the department had cut its use of force in half, but still was out there doing the work and had lost considerably more than 300 people, much like Minneapolis is experiencing now. But at the same time, as we cut the use of force in half, you would think we cut the work in half. We didn't. We doubled the work and we had the lowest murder rate and violent crime rate in 50 years. So it can be done. It happened there. So I moved to Baltimore. The DOJ said they were then the worst department in America. So your question is, what's wrong with me? This is this is who I am. This is who we are. And so there I took over in the second year of the consent decree. And it was the worst department in America. We put in the systems of accountability to change the organizational culture. And in changing the organization through policy, training, management, supervision, and discipline, and affecting the internal structure there, the individual and group and organizational culture begin to change. So in August, when I wrapped up my four and a half years there, we had cut use of force in half by 45%. Well, it's just about half, 45%, while also having a 25% reduction in violent crime. So you can have effective policing and reform at the same time. It's been proven twice now. What we want to do is bring lessons learned. No, we don't know Minneapolis, but we understand the, dy the political dynamics of other cities, and we hope to learn what needs, but we bring the lessons from having done it twice and with, with David and Elifa in other cities. Bring lessons learned to help avoid the pitfalls and to help offer our expertise and be a resource to the department and to the city to be able to help them come into compliance and become a better police department. So we're not trying to be perfect because we can't let perfect be the enemy of good. But in those cities that you cited, they were bad. Okay. And we made them better. They've become model departments now. Um, the goal is to become a self-assessing, self-correcting agency. So at some point, Pastor, none of us need to be here to oversee it. The department, you oversee the department and can self-assess and self-correct without oversight. Okay, uh, just to one, one question, and as, as a privilege, I just want to follow up on the New Orleans situation. Uh, is it the case that New Orleans Police Department uh, declared that it was in compliance and others disagreed with that? It, it, was that a situation that occurred in that? that, that... Uh, no. Okay. Um, when you go through paragraph, there are areas where they think we're in compliance and we've not, but there's no disagreement that uh, they've not yet fulfilled okay. the requirements of the consent decree, although they're getting... Pretty close. Kind of okay, I just want to get that. It, it, someone's under the impression that this case, I want to make sure you, you spoke to the idea of whether or not in the case of New Orleans specifically, uh, if, if if a police department declared itself in compliance with which you might have degree, disagreed with them or said they were not, and, and there was a disagreement on them, how you how you reacted or responded to that. Well, there's a, under this, I'm sorry, go ahead. Do, do, were you, do, Arlene? But the police department felt, in fact, that it was um, in compliance. The role of the independent evaluator, the role of this monitor, was to say it was not. And they held to that. Okay. So that's what that role is, is to make sure that even when the police department thinks they have followed all the mandates, 
that what is strong about an independent evaluator and what is strong about any monitor that sits here, your role is to say to the public, they have not fulfilled the requirements. Okay. And that's what happened in New Orleans and that's why they're not in compliance. Okay, thank you. I just want to clarify that. Continue uh, with that, the, the question about, uh, it's for Jensen. Jensen, yes. yes. Thank you. Um, I'm going to get started and 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 turn it over to, to to Rania. But as an independent evaluator or as a monitor, our our, our role is to first set up processes and and work with the agencies to put a system in place that allows them to provide oversight and accountability. And many of the agencies that we are working with, they don't have a, a um, efficient way in which to police themselves. So we're creating processes from the ground up. They don't have a credible complaint system in which to hold officers accountable. And so a lot of the work on the front end is about creating systems. And unfortunately, during that time, use of force incidents may continue to occur. But over time, once these systems are in place and, and the involved individuals have been trained all the while building that cultural change we're in, they want these policies, they believe in these policies, they believe in accountability, we start to ultimately see change. And the question is spot on. Um, monitoring work, independent evaluator, they don't move quickly. Some of it involves the fact that a lot of times monitors come in and they they have no concept of what is going on within that law enforcement agency. And so you have to come in and get an understanding of how their systems are right now to know where they need to be to come into compliance with what is required under the settlement agreement. They don't know the community and they don't know what the community's challenges and experiences have been. Our firm right now, because of the time that we have spent here after the murder of George Floyd, and most recently while we were doing the assessment, we have some of that understanding. We have some of that baseline, but we still need to know more and we still need to hear from, from you. But it is, a long, it is a long process and that is not acceptable. But in order for that process to be ingrained, to be embodied, and to be perfected, it does take change. But I'll just go back to San Francisco again. It is one of those agencies where it's five years, but we are starting to see that. Bakersfield, everything you said about Bakersfield, you are spot on. We've 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 just completed, I think, our our our, our second year there. And and they are a challenging agency. I'm I'm just going to, to to say it. They are a challenging agency. Um, and we have a lot of work to do to get them where they need to be, but it also requires their participation to do the things that they have to do. I'd like to just let my colleague say a few things because she's been in the trenches in San Francisco. And I really want to be mindful that my answers are not trying to placate. I'm not trying to make excuses, um, but really just build on what Sydney said in San Francisco, unfortunately, because over the five years, the politicians in that city decided to try and fiddle with the reforms and they've defunded efforts and made it really hard to actually get the police department where they need to be. I'm not making excuses. I'm just sharing the reality of where we live. And I'm sure you have some of that here as well. Bakersfield not wrong. It's hideous. I mean, they're in the news just recently, but there's only so much that we can do as evaluators. At the end of the day, we're trying to work ourselves out of a job. It's really important to me to build on what you already know, give you some more tools, make sure, like track with you, but eventually leave you to it. You, I, you know, you kind of had the sentiment I think across the board, that's really imperative for us. So I absolutely hear you. And I do want to add one thing. Some of the data points that you provide aren't across the board. And so something that I'm very mindful of and that we'd want to do is fix those metrics with you. What does success look like for you? Is it the crime rate? Is it the complaint rate? Like start there so that you do have a mechanism that you can track across the years and actually be able to see whether there's an increase, decrease or some improvement. Thank you. Roman. And you're going to have Professor Lopez. Hi, uh, Christy Lopez. And I am really, uh, I really do appreciate that question because it's one I've been asking for many years now. Um, I'm a civil rights attorney. I've spent years uh, investigating police departments. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I am a civil rights attorney. I've investigated police departments and I've been asking the same question for years. 
Um, I helped develop some of the monitoring, uh, you know, structures that are in place now. And I have all of the same critiques. They drag on too long. Um, they cost too much money. And we're, I don't think people would mind that they last so long. As you all know, that, you know, we've been dealing with these problems for a long time. The problem is that they don't seem to solve the problem and there seems to be backsliding. So we've got to change that. And that's why I joined this team, because I think the answer to that question really is community, not because communities, you know, that not just because, deal, you know, uh, working with communities is inherently good, but because that's the answer to the problem. In New Orleans, for example, when Chief Harrison was there, they made great gains and then he left and there's been backsliding because of the, in large part, I think, because of the change of a chief, even though they have a very good monitoring team and a, and a really focused judge. Why is that? I think it's because community was not empowered during that time to really be able to take up the mantle and care and create and be the structure that would demand accountability from the city after a reform minded chief left. So I think that what you need to um, what you need to recognize with these agreements is that a consent decree is one maybe essential part of the larger solution to policing. Right. One piece of it. Right. It's a really important piece. It's the only piece that is obligatory. The city has to do these things. And we know that consent decrees actually can reduce, they reduce killings by police officers. They reduce violence by police officers, but they're not gonna fix a lot of the racial disparities on their own. They're not gonna do all of that work. That's why if you're monitoring this agreement, you need to be supporting, creating capacity, creating space for all the people who have been doing this work to keep doing that work and to do it more and to make sure that the city is held accountable to those people, not just to you and the judge and the monitoring team, because those are the people who are going to bring about the change after the agreement is long gone. So that's why I joined this team, because this is a group of team with deep experience working with communities, holding leaders accountable for discrimination and really learning how to make sure that these agreements stick. It's fine that they cost a lot of money right? Bad policing costs a lot of money. It's fine that they um, take a long time. These problems have been with us uh, for a long time, but they need to work and they need to stick. And when the agreement's done, this, the, the city needs to be better. And the people are do, who are doing the work need to be empowered to continue that work and continually be improving public safety in their communities for communities. Let, let's continue. There's another question I think is related to that one. And I want to go into the, I think a little bit further into it. So even after a reasonable time, under your monitoring, uh, and and you know the we start you start to see that the mandated changes in the agreement are not being realized. What what do you do? What what mis, mid course corrections or alternative approaches do you bring to bear? How do you get uh, you sort of again do that sort of uh, that accountability move? Uh, if even after a reasonable time that it just is just not happening. I'll start with you, Jensen, on, on answering that question. I don't think I need to pull that. I think this will work right here. Um, one of the first things that we do is we're making sure that we are in close contact with the law enforcement agency that we're working with, telling them what we're seeing, letting them know clearly that they are not making the mark, identifying for them what is it that they think is standing in the way? Us assessing, looking at the data, looking at the process, identifying what is in the way and bringing that to their attention. But importantly, communicating with the community to let you know how they are performing, to let you know what their challenges are and to identify ways in which you can contribute to the success of that organization. But the main thing is to call it out provide recommendations and suggestions, continue to call it out, to, to be transparent with the community and make sure that you are aware of, of what their progress is. And, and, and you see that in the monitoring reports that we've done in the Virgin Islands and the monitoring reports that we've done um, recently in Bakersfield. I, are the San Francisco reports public? Yeah. And in the reports that we've done in, in, in San Francisco, we, are, we hold no punches about how a department is performing, doing well or not. We make it very clear. And when we identify that an agency is not, uh, not reaching compliance, we're clear and we continue to say it. We don't run out of stamina just because the agency isn't coming into compliance with the requirements of the settlement agreement. Can I just build, I think the, um, 
I, I think the other thing that's important to note is the something else that we use in our process is actually our own listening sessions. So even if they are in compliance, we tend to hold community meetings similar to this, but it's much more listening to you guys to hear whether you can feel the impact, you can feel the change from that thing that they said they did. Because if you can't feel it, it's still, even though they check the box, something's still up. There's something wrong then either with that recommendation or there's some loss in translation between the policy that's on the paper and the actions in this free. Okay. Roman? I think I'm probably getting this question because I have I am a monitor in a very, or at least a previously really recalcitrant, really resistant uh, jurisdiction. And so we have, uh, we are at a place where we made a bunch of progress early on. We had a change of administration. And when I mean we fell below, the department fell below, it was with a boom at the end. Uh, it went way down. And so we have been working with them to find the next generation of allies within the department that we can work with and talk with and create small wins within that context and prove to them that you prove to the department as well as the community. Because there's some there's some departments that just think that they can wait us all out. Yeah. Right. It's I know I, everyone's nodding. Like we <laughs> they can just wait us out long enough. And in one jurisdiction, I've been there for eight years. We, they have not been successful in waiting us out. We also hold commuter meetings like this. It's the best days I have, ma'am, I'm talking to you later, because it's the best days I have when I pr produce data reports that get held up in meetings. And the community says, we are gonna hold you accountable for what the monitor is asking you to do, what the federal court is asking for you to do, and what from the, what the state is asking you to do. Those are my best days, it's one of my best weapons. In, in getting these things implemented. But you also have to teach the department sometimes how to accept wins and how, how actually treating the community better is better for law enforcement. Treating, implementing constitutional policing keeps law enforcement safe as well. And you've got to do those things over a period of time so that they see the benefits. So it's long-term, you got to be in it for the long-term. You've got to involve your community from the word go, and we are partners with you on this. Uh, yes, we are independent monitors, but this is your community. And this is this is work that you need to own long-term. We are a, a necessary but insufficient solution to this problem. It is the community being able to, to use the data that's provided, to be able to read the, understand uh, the compliance assessments that we're making and being able to, to really take the action that's long-term there. And I can give you some examples on like how we work with deputies or in law enforcement around that. We had a, one of the things that was happening in our community was the, the department was asking pretty much every person of color, pretty much every black person they stopped if they were on probation or parole. I don't need to tell you that that's an invasive and can be very be viewed as a rude practice. When you're pulled over for a routine traffic stop, if you're on probation or parole, it's not a question you want to hear at the time. The department didn't have any means at the time. Their data systems were inadequate. Common themes across the country. They didn't have any mechanism for, for monitoring or addressing that. We changed their data system real quickly. We did a quick fix that was in lieu of a long-term, more comprehensive improvement in their data information system. And we were able to get them just quick analysis. Data doesn't have to be overly complicated. Data can be quick and easy. And like here in each of these stations, this number of officers is asking every person they stop if they're on probation or patrol. So it allowed sergeants and supervisors to do an immediate intervention and target those particular behaviors for change. And it worked. The, the, the numbers of people asked if they're on probation or parole went way down. I know it's a small thing, but it did. that's something we did really early on to both build trust with the community that they see, all right, this is changing. This is my day-to-day -day interaction Thank with law you. enforcement. It's getting a little bit better. I've got so many notes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank effective you. law enforcement. Um, so I, I agree. The, the community has a very powerful voice in this. 
here in this uh, agreement, the city and the MPD have already committed to making changes. And they say, although we will evaluate in the assessment period, that they are beginning to make progress. So if they stop, then they would have to explain to you all and to us, well, wait a minute, what happened? You said you were doing this. Why are you not doing it? And make no mistake, when we, if we have come to a meeting and say they are not doing this, they don't want that pushback from the community because they work for you. And, and that's a powerful uh, force. But keep in mind, this is a consent agreement, two pieces. One is their agreement to do it, but consent um, consent is, is uh, let me try that again. Their agreement is essentially a consent decree. The consent part is their agreement to do this, and the decree part is this an order of the court. Yes. So the fastest, cheapest way for the city of Minneapolis to get out of this agreement is to run as fast as they can to implement it and force us to keep up with them. But if they don't, they have to go to court, and the court ultimately decides whether they have honored the terms of the agreement. Now, Christy talked about some backsliding in New Orleans. There's always a little back and forth. Some things move ahead, and then you look back and say, this change didn't stick. That happens in every consent decree. We did have an issue where we had a new superintendent in January, and for the first time in the course of this consent decree, they did things that we thought were directly not compliant with the consent decree, and they disagreed. So we uh, we reported that to the court. The court issued an order finding them not in compliance, threatened to sanction them, and then suddenly the city decided, the department decided, okay, well, we're going to make these changes, and that superintendent is gone. So there are levers here. This is, this is a partnership. We have our role to play to monitor and report. You have a role to play to engage and to uh, address your elected officials and your police department. And if we have to go to court, we can. Although I will tell you that is the most expensive and least efficient way to get change. Litigation was not designed to perform restorative justice in the main. So what we want to do is create the conditions for cooperation, collaboration, and accountability so we can get this done as soon as possible. And if they don't, we'll say so. And if we have to, we'll go to court. Thank you. Uh, this this leads to the question, I think all of you have said it in some way, and I want you to say more about it. I want you to go a little bit deeper in it. Uh, describe how you uh, envision keeping the community updated on what's going on. What is your best practice or your practice for keeping the community engaged and informed about the process and the progress that is being made? I'll start with you, Relvin. Thank you. And I'm going to push back a little bit on the question because updated is the wrong word. If we have to update you, then we have already failed. For us, we are talking about community engagement at every step of the process. Uh, so what does that actually mean in practice, right? Because everybody today, we're all talking community. We've said the word community about 50, 11 times. So uh, what does it actually mean for us in practice? Uh, if you've heard the phrase, nothing about us without us, which is popularized uh, by disability justice advocates uh, for too long, both in cities uh, with consent decrees and cities without, uh, policies, practices, training has been uh, developed with community engagement in silence, right? And so sometimes you might have a town hall you might have a listening session, or you might have a few interviews, but what it means is you're going in and out with community instead of walking lockstep with them, arm in arm at every step of the way. So when we are talking about development, when we're talking about conception, uh, when we are talking about uh, revisions and execution, of policies uh, where the where the the negotiated agreement allows, where we're talking about training, where the negotiated agreement allows, we're talking about hand in hand partnerships all along the way. And look, I come out of Black movement organizing. I know what it feels like to feel uh, like like you're being extracted from, 
right? Uh, to feel like somebody is coming in and trying to take away from you, uh, but without actually building with you. And so that's why we are working to develop a process that within the confines of this agreement can give us the opportunity to build uh, capacity together. This isn't just a report back. It's not just a check-in. It is, um, does this seem right to you as we're building together? Uh, and if not, uh, what, you know, what should this look like? When we're getting numbers, when we get the numbers that, uh, that Angie was talking about, it's not enough for us to just say that the numbers are the full story because the numbers aren't the full story unless you're telling us what it actually means, what it actually feels like to be policed in your communities. And so we've done this in DC. We know that it's not all kumbaya. It's really hard work, but we brought the Metropolitan Police Department together with uh, community activists, with families of victims of violence, with violence intervention workers. Um, and we've put together participatory process to help in, uh, develop law enforcement policies that can help achieve the goals that we actually all share, which is less violence in the streets. Thank we you. did that with transparency and honesty, and we held the complexity and the difficulty together. We never shied away from the difficulty. Thank you. Effective. That's a really good question because that's really very, it's, it's a tough challenge because this is a massive project. It will generate lots of information a lot of it very specialized. So how do you translate that out to the public at large? So here, here's the way we think about it. At, at this stage, what it, we are all applying for a job to be a trusted advisor yeah. to the selection panel and to organizations, to the organizations that have individuals and organizations that have come here tonight. But the organizations themselves are trusted advisors for their constituencies in the community. So the way we have to transmit information, and that's why we talk about the map and a grant, is we will report um, to the groups. And I'll talk about how it's a multi-channel. It has to be multi-channel. But we'll report to those groups, and we want those groups to, in turn, be able to say to their members, to their neighbors, um, what's happening. And, and we, we've seen it. We've had community organization in New Orleans say to their neighbors, oh no, this is working, right? That that we'll have some credibility reporting too, but you all will have credibility reporting out to the community. Now, how do we do that? So we will issue reports and I will say one of the lessons from New Orleans, we're lawyers, we like to write. We write big, <laughs> very detailed reports. Most people don't really like to read large detailed reports. And so a lesson is we have to uh, condense it down. And actually I was very impressed with the Department of Human Rights report, I will confess, when I first went to look at the agreement, I got to their site, they had the summary, and I'm alive. I'm like, where is the agreement? I need to read the contract. Then I realized, oh, you know what? Most people just need to read the summary. So we have to, one of our lessons is to get better about uh, communicating simply and directly. But even then, in this day and age of the uh, uh, internet, social media, we have to have channels of communication that are accessible uh, to, to many people. Because the truth is, most people are spending their time at work and taking care of their family. Like they're not going to spend a lot of time tracking this and they shouldn't have to, but we should make sure it comes out easily. We will do not only public meetings, but what we do when we're here on the ground, we just meet, we can meet for lunch or, and you know, we have telephones and cell phones and we'll develop relationships. And that's what I talked about the continuity. So if you've been working with us, then we come to town, we can say, Oh, we talked about this when we were here a month ago. Here's where we are. So it's a it's 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 several channels of communication that go two ways from sort of the very formal to really just the informal. And it is our responsibility to make sure we're accessible and we build relationships uh, with all of the uh, interested constituencies. So, for example, I was asked yesterday uh, uh, about uh, mental health crisis response. Uh, and I'm happy to talk uh, with the person about it. But Julie Solomon, who is our mental health crisis team, when she comes out here, I expect her to meet with people. So we will um, communicate on an ongoing basis uh, with those people who are interested, and we will develop the systems so that people can engage uh, at, at the level that works for them. Thank you. Jensen. I'm happy to start and I'll um, make sure to leave sometime, uh, see if my colleagues want to weigh in. Um, 
two parts to that, updated and engaged. So the update in terms of info out, similar to what you would have heard, websites, the, ensuring that all the reports, whether p the police department likes it or not, are made public, comments, spaces for you to engage with us. We're also very personable. So when we are here, you're likely to get our numbers and we don't mind. Send me an email, shoot me a text, do the things that you need to do. This really is about co-creation. And I think that's the engaged portion, right? It's making sure that you have an avenue into the discussions. We're not gonna be creating from scratch. Um, to the point that's already been made, that report, the fact that you guys actually designed or helped um, shape the consent decree, one is incredibly unusual and incredibly um, uh, incredible. I mean, it's, it really is quite thoughtful. And so rather than reinvent the wheel and tell you about things that we're going to do, we're going to build on what you already have and work with you. That's co-creation and co-development and really hearing the moment that you're in. So I'll give you an example because we've been talking about policies before. Um, I was helping with the uh, community part, uh, community engagement and the use of force policy in Oakland. And it is long and it's trying. And the reason it is, again, is making sure that the community understands what's being said, not just, you know, have you read it, but what do you understand by it? What do you assume? Because just because we all have different lenses and different perspectives, things that you read are gonna land differently for you than they are for me, than they might for my colleague. So let's make sure that we have that base level of understanding. And then we're facilitating a discussion and building out that policy. We then went into COVID. So public meetings weren't a thing and we had to figure out really quickly how we were going to continue that. And that's the kind of agility and that's the kind of co-creation that we are hoping to and anticipate doing with you lot. It's being able to hear what's needed and then and then kind of plug it in. Um, just a couple of other quick things. Um, we're really keen on finding expertise and experience and not only the community coalitions here to help speak to what the community is feeling, but procedural justice experts, uh, racial justice experts, trauma facilitators. I think it's also really important that we center trauma, center anger, understand what this is, what the passion is, and then allow us all to heal as we build from there. I do want to see if anyone else from the team wants oh, to weigh well, in. Actually, we're going to have oh. to cut you off there. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, I'm teasing, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I'm game. Let the community interview and let the community decide who they want to work with. Because we can't just settle for what is going to happen after this meeting tomorrow. See, it's too much money at stake. It's too much money. You all are going to get millions of dollars for this work. So you have to be effective. And the research has to be done. We don't, I don't, I, okay, I've done the research on what you've done already, but my thing is, what are you, what are you prepared to do now? We're dealing with the Minneapolis Police Department. They special. Yeah. So you have to, what, what is the agenda? What is the curriculum? Okay. See, that's what I was looking forward to looking at. I understand your proposal and what you're going to do and what you said you've done to get the contract. My thing is, what are you prepared to do? You understand? Because it's millions of dollars. And the city of Minneapolis, they got money to burn because they don't care who they give money to. They don't. Okay. They go write the check. Okay. I'm sorry, Pastor. Okay. I'm, I'm offended. Okay. But all I'm saying is I don't see a curriculum. I don't see an agenda. I don't I don't see a training schedule. I don't see how you de-escalated internal racism within black departments. Tyree Nichols is a great example of what happened to black men by black police. So all I'm saying is, this right here is fine. I'm not against nobody. All I'm saying is, I want to be careful on who the city pick, and I think it should be the community that pick who they want to work with, not the mayor, but the community. Okay. This is, uh, okay. Um, and, and this, again, some of these things are quite related. The question, next question is, you you all read that agreement. You read a request for proposal, uh, and you decided to uh, answer that with a proposal. And one of the questions is, when you looked at that at that agreement, what in the existing agreement do you consider is most critical to driving culture change in the Minneapolis Police Department? And then, what is missing? Uh, again, uh, just in response to the gentlewoman's question, uh, what I wanted to say to you is that, again, they are looking at the agreement. 
an agreement that you can look at too, and all of you all can be on the same uh, page. What they have to do is, and that's why we asked the original, the other question about if you see that the police department is not in compliance, what are you? What is your response to it, and what are you willing to do? This question now is: You've seen that existing agreement. Uh, you've looked at the reports. What in those agreements do you consider to be most effective in driving culture change in the police department? And what do you think is missing from it? And I'll start with Jensen. Ed. Yeah, I think, um, okay, everyone's hammering home community, community, community. But what's what I saw in the settlement uh, agreement, again, my, my interaction with it thus far has been looking at it purely from a training perspective was that it's looking at it and it it doesn't touch on values, right? We're talking about training. We're talking about community involvement. But none of these things, you can comply on paper with any with all of those compliance measures. Yeah. But if they're not rooted in the same shared values, yeah. compliance on paper is not going to equate to performance. It's not going to, it's not going to equate to community satisfaction. So I think what's missing from the settlement agreement is the, the fact that we have to develop that shared sense of what is it that the Minneapolis Police Department is supposed to do? What is it? They, what are they? How are they supposed to act? What is it supposed to look like? What's their interaction supposed to look like? And I can guarantee you, the prop in all the places that I've worked that have been troubled, it's because the police department sees it as one way, thinking that they're doing things right. The community sees it as completely inappropriate, and then sometimes even the government entities involved don't agree with what it's supposed to look like for budgetary or political reasons. So for any of this to work, the settlement agreement to have any sort of validity at the end and the sustained um, success for it is the establishment of those shared values, not necessarily agreement. We don't have to always agree, but we have to understand the values. We have to at least appreciate where the where, the, where all sides are coming from. And then we can develop um, solutions moving forward to help them see their way through the compliance aspect of it. Now, I can speak to one of our other engagements that we're in. Some we've seen compliance, and we've seen still that things don't change, right? right. It's and that then it becomes incumbent upon us as the as the monitor team to drill down deeper. Say, okay, well they're in compliance, but we're still not. We still haven't fixed the problem. We can't walk away from that at this point. We then have to drill down and find cause, right? Because some let's let's we 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 come up with these agreements and we come up with compliance measures. But sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes the compliance measure doesn't address the actual root of the problem that we're dealing with. And that's why this has to be an agile, nimble, ongoing relationship. So we can say, well, they're in compliance, but we have to hear from the community to say, well, we're still, and this has been mentioned, that we're not happy with the result. Then we go back to the table and say, listen, you are in compliance, but it's not giving us the outcomes that we're looking for. And we still haven't really established what the root causes of the problems are. So I think that's the biggest challenge that we have. And I think that's what I see missing from the settlement. So the settlement, is, and as my colleague here said, it's a decree. It's from the courts. Courts don't necessarily get involved always with, with the emotional or the, the, the kind of interpersonal aspects of things. And that's, what, that's where we bridge the gap. We can do the legal side. But we're also in touch with the emotional side and the value side, and that's what makes that's what makes our team so effective. Thank you. Effective. I think that's a great question, and we looked at it closely, and there were things that really stuck out to us. The chiefs, Marianne, Orlinda, and I, we clearly saw something, but David and uh, and other monitors on the team also saw the same thing, and it was the clear lack of accountability clear lack of systems of accountability, rather, where the department could not hold its members accountable. The department could not hold itself accountable. So when you talk about the word culture, the culture is such that officers, members of the department will do things because it is likely that if they do it and it's wrong, nothing will happen. Or even if somebody reports it, nothing could be done about it. That was, was clear to us. So for us, lessons learned, in a number of cities bring us to build systems of accountability that informs the department of what it needs to do to get in front of it to fix it through policy, training, supervision, management, and discipline all at the same time. And when we course correct that from those five buckets, we can then change officer performance 
because there's systems of accountability and officers have to perform according to policy and training. Supervisors have to supervise according to super, supervisory policy and training. And when they don't, there are consequences for failure to perform, either intentionally or unintentionally. And so we aim to build, to help the department rather, build those systems of accountability that inform the department of what needs to be done to get in front of it and the appropriate response when something happens and is brought to the agency's attention. And then our job is to report to you whether they're doing that appropriately in a timely manner or whether they are not doing it. And then what the answer to your question, what are we going to do about it? We're going to let you know that either they did it well or they did not do it well. Consent decrees do not does not mean the absence of a bad thing happening but rather sometimes the appropriate response when something does happen. Now, surely we wanna minimize those and reduce those. We wanna eliminate those, but when they do happen, we wanna make sure that there are systems of accountability that speak to how the agency responds. And our job is to report to you, report to the court that they did it well, they did it at all, they did it well, or they did it poorly or not at all. And you are the determining factor on whether that's acceptable or not. Our job is to assess, make recommendations, and report to you what is done. And we will do that, and we will not be intimidated nor amused by any political influence or anything. Our job is to tell it like it is, and you're the people we're telling it to. Thank Can you. Add, sorry, Thank you. Can I make another 40 seconds? Uh, Thanks. Can you tomorrow? I'm coming tomorrow as well. Can each group? provide like uh, the case scenario that I just gave with the Tyree Nichols and Memphis Police Department. Can you all provide me with what something that you would have done to kind of uh, address that type of situation? What could you have done to break down that warrior mentality mm -hmm. and, and transform it into a mentality of compassion? Mm -hmm. And how would you address that type of internalized racism within black city departments. Uh, uh, we'll, uh, happy to answer That's that. Your <laughs> happy to do it tomorrow and happy to talk to you about it yeah. just one on one. Okay. That's a great. I, I just wanted to say the other thing I noticed I, as consent decrees go, this one did have a lot of mechanisms for community engagement. It went further. But what seemed to be missing was the structure of it. It was a lot about meeting, but meetings you get different people showing up that there's a there is a need for a structured organization on behalf of the community and that's something we would want to build out on but we need a better understanding of what's currently being done and how the existing systems are working but there does need to be a structure that has continuity and defined roles and responsibilities so that's the other piece we thank would. you realman yeah, it's no 40 seconds. We got you. <laughs> um, so honestly, the first thing I did was, was pull up my copy of the original uh, Federal Mediation Agreement back in 2003 um, to, to try to decipher what happened. I mean, you know, it's been mentioned here, but that was a watershed moment for this department in this city back then. And, and I don't know who was all there. I was there. And it was unprecedented. And it was powerful. And it meant something deep, right? And since leaving this department in 2008 um, and then leaving the state in 2013, one of the things I, I wondered right away is what happened. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, that, that goes to exactly what we're talking about when it comes to understanding what it means to actualize any substantive change whatsoever. You know what I mean? So we, we can talk about, you know, systems and, and whatnot, and, and we can talk about, you know, you know, meetings and, and structures, you know, but at the end of the day, it's intentionality. You know, this agreement without intentionality is worthless. It's not worth the paper it's written on. You know, so, you know, when I read through the, this agreement, um, it's a, there, there's a lot of content there, but the implications for deep change are complex. Like, for example, in Section 3, it talks a lot about um, the role of the supervisor, you know, as being a mentor, someone that can do deep qualitative analysis of use of force reports, someone that can, you know, recognize systemic practices of their officers. I mean, you got to build that competency intentionally. You'll just hand them the mandate, hope for the best. 
You know what I mean? So, you know, the, the idea here is, is that the implications of this thing are not superficial. They're not checking the box. Oh, you have a policy. Oh, you have a training regimen. The question is, are people understanding the true nature of the work as it needs to be done in the future? And do they recognize the fact that we've been here before? We've been here before. So I'm glad, Al, that you spoke up. And Reverend Bethel, it's good to see you. Because the bottom line is, is that history matters. That This is not overlaying what happened in other communities that obviously are still failing. The question is, can we make a fundamental turn here that is unique and distinctly different from every other community? We're not looking to replicate what happened in other places. Different communities, different time, different place, different histories. There's a history here that matters, and there's an approach here that we know we can build that can work, but it's only based on the knowledge of what's already occurred, right, and what needs to occur that's actually going to produce substantive change and not superficial checking of the box. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank all of the candidates here for... And I do want I do want you to invite you to uh, tomorrow's session uh, if you can make it uh, because we will do this again and please invite your neighbors and friends. A couple of things I want to uh, just get you. You were given um, uh, a feedback sheet. Uh, please, please, if you have not gotten it, uh, please get one and respond to it. I'm looking for city people. I think there is on the city website. Uh, a feedback form, but you can also fill out this one. Uh, please, they, this will be very important for you to make sure that you have a record of your feedback and your questions and your response. Again, thank you and see you tomorrow.